Welcome to week 29 as we read the New Testament scriptures as they happened. This week we'll be reading Hebrews 5 to 9. Chapter 5 continues the discussion about the high priestly ministry of Jesus. Jesus, the high priest, was also a human being who was subject to weakness. Because of this, he is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. Jesus deals gently with us too. This chapter also introduces the mysterious Melchizedek, who is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 14, where he's identified as the King of Salem or King of Peace and the Priest of God Most High. He blessed Abram and Abram gave him a tenth of everything or a tithe of everything. Melchizedek is mentioned again in Psalm 110. It's likely that this Psalm was the text that Apollos used as the basis for his letter to the Hebrews. Melchizedek is then a dominant character of Hebrews chapters five to seven, as Apollos shows that Jesus is a greater high priest than the Levitical priests. So who was this man, Melchizedek? Jewish tradition identifies Shem and Melchizedek as the same person. Shem was one of Noah's sons, and Abram was in Shem's family line, according to 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 24 to 27. The book of Jasher, which is quoted by Joshua and Samuel in the Hebrew Scriptures, records that Shem had been Abram's teacher. And when Abram came out from the cave, he went to Noah and his son Shem, and he remained with them to learn the instruction of the Lord and his ways. And no man knew where Abram was. And Abram served Noah and Shem his son for a long time. And Abram was in Noah's house 39 years. And Abram knew the Lord from three years old. And he went in the ways of the Lord until the day of his death, as Noah and his son Shem had taught him. Thus Abram paid the tithe to Shem or Melchizedek because Shem had been his personal teacher. Chapter 5 verse 11 through to chapter 6 verse 12 becomes the third warning in Hebrews. The first warning, if we remember, was to pay the most careful attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. The second is a warning against unbelief. The third warning gives strong caution from the risk of falling away or apostatizing, which is renouncing their Christian faith. The danger was very real because these Hebrew believers, although they had been disciples for quite some time, had never come to maturity. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. For more on this, refer to the teaching series, Exercising Your Spiritual Senses, on the Bayside Church website. At the beginning of chapter 6, Apollos outlines what the elementary teachings of Christianity are. Repentance from acts that lead to death faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. He wants them to leave primary school and graduate to higher things. He pleads with them to stop drifting away from Jesus and to walk closer with Him, learning the deeper truth of righteousness that is available in Jesus alone. He warns them about the dangers of falling away from faith in Jesus and going back unto the old covenant law. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the age to come, who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting Him to public disgrace. Being enlightened refers to those who have been born again and had their eyes open to the spiritual reality of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus taught in John 3. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. Tasted the heavenly gift is speaking about Jesus who said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. Shared in the Holy Spirit denotes those who have been baptized with the Holy Spirit as Jesus prophesied in Acts chapter 1. Tasted the goodness of the Word of God is a summary of what Apollos had already said about the Hebrew Christians only drinking the milk of the Word. He wants them to get into the meat. The powers of the coming age is a reference to the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Anytime you have an encounter with the power of God, it's just a sneak preview of what's coming in the next age. 
He's describing mature believers in Jesus and says it's impossible if someone like that turns away from Jesus and denies him as their savior to bring them back to repentance. They are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. After this stern warning, he gives them great encouragement. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are convinced of better things in your case, the things that have to do with salvation. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end so that what you hope for may be fully realized. We do not want you to become lazy, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. In the final verses of this chapter, he gives the greatest example of faith and patience, Abraham and Sarah, who waited 25 years for the fulfillment of God's promise of a son. Apollos says, be like them. Chapter seven continues to reason that Jesus, the great high priest, is better than any high priest under the old covenant. A priest is one who offers sacrifices, as well as a person who represents people to God and God to people. In the early days of the human race, every person was his or her own priest. Later, the head of a family became the priest, such as Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Job. When the law was given, Aaron became the priest, and from then on, priests were only taken from the tribe of Levi and the family of Aaron. Melchizedek is the first priest mentioned in the Bible, and this is significant. There's a fascinating principle of interpreting and understanding scripture that is one of the proofs of the Bible's inspiration. It's called the law of first mention, and it can be defined as follows. The first time any significant word is stated in the Bible, it gives that word its most comprehensive and exact meaning that then functions as a key to understand the word's correct interpretation throughout scripture. It's significant then that Apollos goes right back to the first mention of a priest, Melchizedek, and says that he is a prototype of Jesus. This chapter gives the most thorough teaching in the New Testament on tithing, which is also mentioned first in the Bible in relation to Abram and Melchizedek in Genesis chapter 14. For more on this, refer to my blog, The Ancient Practice of Tithing on the Bayside Church website. Jesus is a greater priest than Aaron, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. Jesus lives forever. He has conquered death, and so those who place their faith in him will also enjoy everlasting life. Apollos encourages his readers not to put themselves back under the law of the old covenant priesthood because perfection cannot be obtained that way. In fact, speaking of the law, he says, the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless for the law made nothing perfect and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant because he lives forever. He is a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed, for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Under the new covenant, the term priest is applied to all believers who have free access into God's presence and can offer up sacrifices of praise, thanksgiving, and grateful service to God and others. At the beginning of chapter eight, Apollos summarizes his main point. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Sitting down denotes a finished work and the right hand is the place of authority. It's from there that Jesus serves in the true sanctuary rather than the earthly temple that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. Jesus' ministry is as superior to the Hebrew priests as the covenant of which he is a mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. He then quotes extensively from Jeremiah 31, 
verses 31 to 34 to show that the prophets foretold the coming of a new covenant and so this should not come as a surprise. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. This is some of the clearest language in the New Testament concerning the old covenant law and everything that went with it. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The temple of Jesus' day had a square courtyard for Jewish women to the west and the main courtyard for Jewish men to the east. Gentiles were not allowed inside the temple at all on pain of death. The holy place was for the priests and the Holy of Holies was a place where the high priest had access to once a year on the Day of Atonement. The high priest had to make meticulous preparations on this day. He would wash himself, put on special clothing, bring burning incense to let smoke cover his eyes from a direct view of God, and bring blood from an unblemished goat to make atonement for the sins of the people. The curtain divided the holy place from the holy of holies and was a constant reminder that human imperfection renders us unfit for the presence of God. In other words, the curtain was a giant keep out sign. This curtain was made of fine linen and blue, purple and scarlet yarn. There were figures of angels embroidered on it. It was composed of 72 squares sewn together and was so heavy that it required 300 men to lift it. It was 20 meters high, 10 meters wide and 10 centimeters thick. When Jesus died, the curtain was ripped from top to bottom, meaning that this act came from above. It was God's come in sign in which he was saying, you're all welcome. No longer do you need a priest to represent you to God. We all have free access into his presence. The curtain represents Jesus' body, which was given as a sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. God's presence is now accessible to everyone, so we can draw near to Him with confidence that we are acceptable to Him, not because of our works for God, but because of Jesus' perfect work for us. Tradition suggests that the religious authorities sewed up the curtain. Whether this is true or not, the priests certainly continued to offer animal sacrifices, which became a blasphemous act in the light of Jesus' complete sacrifice once and for all. God gave the nation of Israel 40 years to repent, which they did not do. And so in AD 70, the Roman army destroyed Jerusalem and its temple, putting an end to animal sacrifices once and for all. And so the words at the end of chapter eight were prophetic. What is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Considering that Apollos was writing in AD 68, his prophecy would come true two years later. Chapter 9 starts with a summary of Old Covenant worship. It was temporary and focused on the outward. Once again, Apollos refers to the present time, 68 AD, when the tabernacle was still standing, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshipper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. This new order, which began with Jesus, would be fully established once the temple was destroyed and animal sacrifices ceased in 70 AD. The author compares the outward and temporary old covenant to the far better inward and eternal new. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? How much more was a common phrase among people of Jesus' day and formed the basis of a standard Jewish argument called Kal Vahoma arguing from the lesser to the greater. That is, if the lesser is true, how much more the greater? For more on this, check out the teaching series, How Much More, on the Bayside Church website. Apollos illustrates his point by speaking of a person's will that can only be activated upon death. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. 
God's will is to provide salvation and forgiveness to all people. When Jesus died, the will of God was activated. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Enjoy reading these five chapters of Hebrews this week. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for more updates, and I'll see you next week. God became a human being in the person of Jesus. He knows what it's like to be one of us. He empathizes with our weaknesses. He knows about temptation and how to overcome it. Apollos is saying, I know you're going through a tough time, but instead of walking away from God, run towards him. Approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that you may receive mercy and find grace to help you in your time of need.